Let's start today continuing to talk about coin tossing just like we did in class one. Quickly talk about our first two kinds of random experiments again. Example one was to flip a fair coin once. The sample space was HT, a two element sample space. Again, the individual elements in a sample space are often called outcomes. We also need to assign probabilities to those outcomes. The probability of heads really can be anything that you want between zero and one. Of course, if you say the coin is fair, if you say that word fair, you are implying that the probability of heads is 0.5 or one half if you prefer, or 50%. Again, any of those is okay to write. Technically, it needs to be a number between zero and one. It, if you get a negative answer for a probability, it's wrong. If you get a number bigger than one or 100% for a probability, it's wrong. You did something wrong. If that happens on test and you make a note, I will give you a bonus point for acknowledging, yes, I, I got the wrong answer, but I can't figure out where my, my mistake is. I could write curly braces around the H to emphasize I could think of that as a set as well, but I won't bother today. And in this simple example, at least. This does imply the probability of tails would be one minus the probability of heads because these two single element sets, one, L, one set with just H in it and one set with just T in, it, T in it, form what's called a partition of S. Seems kind of weird with a two element set to draw a Venn diagram, but we could. H is right there, T is right there. These two sets, which each have one element in it, in them, have a union that's the entire set, the entire two element set, and their intersection is empty. They are mutually exclusive and therefore the sum of the probabilities of these two sets has to add to one, the probability of the entire sample space. And therefore you can say the probability of tails is one minus the probability of heads. This equation is true even if the coin is not fair. In this case, with a fair coin, it does give a probability of tails equal to 0.5. But even if the coin was not fair, probability of heads is something other than 0.5, like 0.4. This is still true, and you'd find the probability of tails in that case to be 1 minus 0 0.4, 0 0.6. That could happen if somehow you've set up the experiment to not be a fair coin. The coin has got a little magnet in it or something, and you're flipping the coin over some other magnet, and it's somehow causing it to come up heads. Uh, what did I say, 60% of the time or 40%? I forgot. One of those two, all right? You can set things up to not be fair. But if I say the word fair coin, I'm implying that these things are, are the way it is. This is a simple probability example. Next most complicated example was the second one we did last time. Example two, flip a fair coin two times once, then a second time, and then record the overall result. You either get two heads in a row, a head, then a tail, a tail, then a head, and two tails in a row. Is this the same experiment as taking two coins and flipping them at the same time? That's maybe not completely obvious, but it ends up being the same. It ends up being equivalent. And if it's a fair coin or two fair coins, so that the probability of each one being heads is 0.5, then each one of these outcomes is equally likely. And the probability of each one of those outcomes is one fourth, as we talked about last time. I won't write it down again. And if, as we talked about last time, we have an event that I called E last time, our book tends to call events A and B. That is, the event of at least one head then there's three outcomes in it and you can say the probability of getting at least one head p of a well in this situation because these outcomes are equally likely you can use what you read about the classical formula this is n of a divided by n of s 
when your sample space is finite and when the outcomes are equally likely, that's when you can use this formula, right? S can't be infinite because you'd be dividing by infinity. The outcomes have to be equally likely as well. So essentially you're adding up one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth here to get three fourths. Okay. Only use this classical formula when the sample space is finite and when the outcomes are equally likely. Otherwise don't use it. What if the outcomes were not equally likely here? Sub example two, here's something new. What if the probability for this one coin that you're flipping twice of getting ahead is not 0.5, it's not fair. What if it was say 0.4? but you're still going to flip it twice and still record the overall results. The sample space would still be the same. It would still be the same four element sample space, but you could not use this formula to figure out the probability of getting at least one hit. So what would you do in such a situation? Well, we're, what we're about to do is use some ideas in chapter two actually, but also some ideas in chapter one. Going to make a tree diagram. You read about tree diagrams. Representing the overall sequence of things that could happen, you've got the first flip, first flip of say this one coin, just it's simpler to think of it as one coin being flipped twice. You get either heads or tails. And then you got the second flip. Second flip being either heads or tails. This tree diagram is illustrating the four possible things that can happen in a visual way, just like listing them out up here does. But to help figure out how to assign probabilities and to figure out that probability, it's now helpful to write the probability of heads and tails along the branches of this tree. You got a 0.4 probability of heads there and a 0.6 probability of tails. And then, okay, this is a chapter two idea. Assuming the flips are independent of each other, meaning, so I'm a, I done, I've done the first flip, now I'm about to do the second. Does the fact that I got, say, a heads the first flip affect the chances of getting a heads the second? Intuitively, you would think no. As long as I'm doing some vigorous flipping, it's flipping, it's twirling around a lot as I flip it, it shouldn't affect it. That's called independence. And it's an assumption we're making when it seems reasonable, as this does seem reasonable. So I use the same probabilities along these other branches, 0.4 here, 0.6 here, 0.4 here, and 0.6 here. How is this helpful? What we do next is we want to figure out the probabilities of each of these outcomes, HH, HT, TH, and TT. They're not all going to be one fourth. To find them, you multiply the numbers along the branches, it turns out. And that works because of independence, though I'm not explaining why. Should seem somewhat intuitive. For example, the probability of HH Getting H the first time and H the second time should be 0.4 squared, 0.16. The probability of getting H the first time and tails the second time should be 0.4 times 0 0.6, 0 0.24. The probability of getting tails the first time then has the second time, second time should be 0.6 times 0.4, also 0.24. And the probability of getting tails twice in a row should be 0 0.6 squared, 0.36. To confirm this is a valid probability model, all these numbers should add up to one. Do they? Add them up. 0.16 plus 0.24 is 0 0.4. Plus another 0.24 is up to 0.64. Plus 0.36, yes, is one. You could write 1.00 for extra emphasis if you want. But you also could just write a one. It's not a big deal. And therefore now the probability of 
the same event as before, getting at least one head. Well, what are the events where we got at least one head? There are the H's. So there's three paths through the diagram where there's at least one head. I can't use N of A divided by N of S because these outcomes are not equally likely. You've got to add these three numbers and you're going to get 0.64. If your probability of heads is not 0.5, but 0.4, then when you flip the coin twice, the probability of getting at least one head has gone down as it, you would think it should from 0.75 to 0.64. It's intuitive that you get a smaller number and you do. I am still using what's in a sense called the probability addition rule for mutually exclusive events. These individual events, these outcomes, H, 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 T, T, H, as sets are mutually exclusive. There's no overlap between them. The intersection of any two of them is empty. Therefore, to find the probability of the compound event, A, that is really the union of those three things, as you see here, can be found by adding the probability of each event, each outcome individually. That's what I did there. That's called the probability addition rule for mutually exclusive events. A fancy sounding name for what's really a simple idea. Probability addition rule for mutually exclusive events. You could also call mutually exclusive um, mutually disjoint. Exclusive in set notation or terminology would be disjoint. You take any two of these sets and you take their intersection, it's going to be the empty set. They have nothing in common. Can I clarify anything there? You might say this feels really basic, and yeah, you could argue it is, but these are really, really fundamental things that apply to much more complicated situations. Should we try flipping a coin three times? Oh, why not? Flip a coin three times. This is example three. Flip a, okay, let's start with a fair coin. A fair coin three times. <clears throat> How many outcomes are there gonna be in the sample space? Maybe you can just do it in your head like that. Anybody wanna say? I heard a nine, I heard an eight. It's eight. If you're unsure, I mean, you could try listing them out and eventually you'd see there's just eight. You also could make a more detailed tree diagram with three sets of branches. And ultimately there's eight paths through the diagram from left to right, two times two times two. The size of the sample space is gonna be two cubed is eight. Another way to think of that fact and realize that if we had, we were flipping four times, we'd get two to the fourth is 16. Flip five times, you'd get two to the fifth is 32. Flip a coin 10 times, you'd get two to the 10th outcomes in the sample space, 1,024. I got it memorized. I should probably have 10 to the 20th memorized. It'd be 1,024 squared, a million something. I don't have it memorized. Your tree diagram would get really, really nasty once you're up to like seven or eight for the number of flips. You wouldn't want to draw it anymore. Eight's still small enough that you, it's not a pain, too much of a pain to list these out. H, 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 T. H, T, H, T, H, H. Uh, how about let's do T, T, H, T, H, T, 
H T T, and then finally T T T. And notice I'm kind of lining those up in a nice way. If indeed the probability of heads on one flip is one half, 0.5. And if, if as seems reasonable, flips are independent, these are all gonna be equally likely. There's eight of them, eight outcomes. Therefore, the probability of one of any one of them is one eighth, 0. 0.125, 12.5%. It's a fair coin. You got to know that it's a fair coin to be able to say that. And we got to also talk about compound events. What's the probability of getting at least one head here? Well, there's seven ways to get one head, everything except that one. Seven eighths would be the probability of getting at least one head. How about the probability of getting at least two heads, two or more? There's one, two, three, four outcomes where there's at least two heads. Four out of eight, one half is your probability of getting at least two heads, meaning two or three heads when you flip a fair coin three times. How about die rolling? Of course, Okay, if you roll one fair die with six sides, if I don't say it's six-sided, assume it's six-sided. Of course, I maybe you've never seen these. There are d dice you can make that are not six-sided. They're not a cube. They're like a dodecahedron or something, which is uh, 10 sides, 20 sides, one of those two, that you can roll. Okay, ordinary six-sided die fair it's not weighted there's no magnet inside you roll it vigorously down a table on the floor the probability of getting a one is one six the probability of getting a two is one six etc okay let's roll a fair die twice and yes die is the singular of dice sorry die is the singular of twice dice What's your probability? Oh, here's something a little different. What's your probability of getting a sum if the sum for the sum of the dice to be five? Well, you could start listing out all the probability, all the possibilities in a sample space. How many would there be? If you think about drawing a tree diagram without actually drawing it, you'd have six branches in the first thing, first path. For each of those, you have six more, six squared, 36 possibilities. You could write it out as a set this kind of way, but already I'm feeling tired of doing that. I don't feel like writing out all 36 of them. It'd be nice to have a diagram and, hey, how do you know, what do you know? I have a diagram here. How about that's, wait a minute. Where'd my bigger diagram go? This one's not very big. Oh, well. Nice to find a diagram like that somewhere. What's the probability that the sum of the numbers on the two dice that I rolled is five? There's 36 possible outcomes. If they're all equally likely, the probability of any one of these is 136 then in the ballpark of 3% chance. Which ones have a sum of five? So I said earlier today, I say six. They say five, okay, sum of five. These do. So your probability that the sum is five, assuming equally likely outcomes, I can use the classical formula. It's the number of elements in that outcome, in that event, one, two, three, four, divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space, 436th 
two eighteen one ninth, which is point one repeating, approximately an eleven percent chance that when you roll two dice vigorously, the sum is going to be five. You could ask for strange kinds of compound events. You could ask, what's the probability that the sum is a prime number? Two, three, five, seven, and 11, I guess. Five prime numbers between two and 12. Only one way to get a sum of two, two ways to get a sum of three. We've just found four ways to get a sum of five. So we're, that's up to seven outcomes. How many ways of getting a sum of seven? Six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six. The sum being seven is the most common outcome. So we're up to what? Seven, up to 13 possibilities. And then a sum of 11, two more 13 out of 36, which cannot be reduced. That would be your probability that the sum is prime as another kind of question you could answer. And if you happen to know the probability that the sum is, well, that the sum is five, like we do, you could also easily then figure out the probability that the sum is not five without even counting. Once you've got this, because these are complementary events. Complementary. They are disjoint, their intersection is empty. If you get a sum of five, that means you did not, not get a sum of five, right? I said that right. If you get a sum of five, that means you did not, not get a sum of five. And if you did not get a sum of five, well, yes, then you did not get a sum of five. These can't happen at the same time when you roll two dice. And their union is the entire sample space one of these two things has to happen when you roll two dice, ignoring gorillas coming through rooms and eating your dice. So because of that, I hope it makes sense. The probability is one minus the probability that the sum is five. This is a chapter two idea as well. I've already emphasized it. About an 89% chance that the sum is not five. Okay, pretty basic ideas in the context of fairly simple examples, but again, these apply to harder things. We're about to do something harder now. We're gonna talk about combinations and permutations and combinations and how that applies to harder probability problems. As I mentioned in a message to you, I do have um, PowerPoint slides that I've made in the past. I'm trying to mostly avoid using them a ton in class, except it's nice when you got kind of detailed problems as you see in the textbook to be able to see them. These are not probability, probability problems that you see here. They are counting problems permutations and combinations that you should have read about. In many situations in probability, it's helpful to know about permutations and combinations. That's why we want to learn about them. They can help you solve probability problems, not just now, but especially in chapter three and the applications of what we find in chapter three later on. It's about counting. The broader subject is called combinatorics, part of discrete math. Let's look at this first one. A club of seven people must select a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. In how many ways can this be done? Must select a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Let's solve a simpler problem first. Let's pretend instead of seven people, there's just four people, okay? 
And those people happen to luckily have first names that start with the letters A, B, C, and D. How fortunate. How many ways can we select a president, a secretary, and a treasurer? You can think of it in terms of a tree die. First, select the president. There are four people you can choose from, A, B, C, and D. Once you select the president, then you got to select the secretary. Continue the tree diagram, but realize that once somebody has been selected president, like if A is president, A cannot be secretary. That's an assumption you'd be making, a natural assumption. So if A is selected president, there's only three choices for the secretary, B, C, or D. I should have made my diagram bigger. Well, if B is selected president, there's three choices for secretary, A, C, and D. And if C is selected president, there's three choices for secretary, A, B, and D. Is that big enough? That B is hard to see. And if D is selected president, there's three choices for secretary A, B, and C. Finally, you got to se select the treasurer. Uh, I won't draw the entire diagram. If A is president and B is secretary, you've got two choices for set treasurer C and D. If A is president and C is secretary, you've got two choices for treasurer, B and D, et cetera. How many paths are there through the tree diagram? Multiply four times three times two, right? There's four branches initially. For each of those four branches, you've got three more branches attached. And for each of those two branch combinations, I probably shouldn't use the word combination. You've got two more branches attached. Altogether, you got four times three times two. That's not a 21 there. Ignore that. Four times three times two. 24 paths through the tree diagram. And there are for 24 ways you can choose a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. And oh, for fun, why don't we also multiply by one? Huh? Well, okay. No, no. Actually, I'm not going to want. Yeah, yeah. That I could multiply by one. I was, I was thinking too far ahead. Okay, ignore that. I was thinking of something called a factorial. A ignore that. We're just doing four times three times two. If I was only two, choosing two, one for president and one for secretary, there was no treasurer. The answer would just be four times three, twelve. All right. Now we're on to the problem. I'll call it example six, where I've got seven people now instead of four people. Where'd it go? Seven people now instead of four. Imagine making a tree diagram. Don't literally make a tree diagram. You'd have seven people that you can choose from for president. For each of those seven branches, you'd add on six more for the choice of treasurer, secretary. And for each of those two paths, two branch paths, you'd add on five more branches for the choice of treasurer. Altogether, there's seven times six times five. And what is that? 210 ways to choose a president, a treasurer, a secretary. And the book likes putting, uh, setting this up as a problem solving idea in terms of slots. And you'd like maybe put a P here and S here and a T there for president, secretary, and treasurer. You've got seven people that you can choose there. Once you've chosen a president, you've got six 
to choose for secretary. Once you've chosen both the president and the secretary, you've got five more choices for the treasurer. This is how they sort of show you how they do their work. What am I using here? I'm using something called the multiplication principle. When you look at the multiplication principle in the book, it looks like a really fancy thing. Like what, do I have to memorize this? Multiplication principle. Consider an experiment taking place in K stages. Let N sub I denote the number of ways in which stage I can occur for I through equals one through K. Altogether, the experiment can occur in, uh, what's that? That's a capital pi, meaning product, just like capital sigma means sum. You were confused about that. That's a product. You know, sigma starts with an S just like sum does. Pi starts with P just like product does. Multiply all those numbers. Okay, this is a fancy way of saying a really simple idea. This idea that I just used here. And this process of taking a group of people in this case and putting them in a certain order effectively, the ordering being president, secretary, treasurer, is called a permutation. In this class, a permutation is an ordering of a group of objects. If you end up, if you're a math major or math or data science, you'll take a class called algebra, abstract algebra, where a permutation is something different. It's actually a function. They actually are related. It's a, it's a special kind of function, but for us, a permutation in this class is an ordering of a group of objects. In this case, the objects are people. And the ordering corresponds to choosing president, secretary, and treasurer. NPR with the N as a pre-subscript and the R as a post-subscript, NPR, not National Public Radio, is called as a symbol for the number of permutations of our objects taken from a group of N objects. Whoa, that sounds fancy. Number of permutations of our objects from a group of N objects. In abstract algebra, the word group has another meaning too. Uh, which we will not talk about. Number of permutations of our objects from a group of N objects. In choosing the president, secretary, and treasurer, we had seven people, seven objects. Sorry to treat people like objects, but okay. And we're choosing three of them in a, for president, secretary, treasurer. We're choosing, we're creating a permutation of three objects from a group of seven. This 210 that we just found here is 7P3. And on TI calculators, here's how you'd confirm that. Type a seven. Then go to math mode, I believe it is. There's a math button right there. Everything's math mode. Math, go over to PRB for probability. And look, NPR. Then type of three. This is doing 7P3. Number of permutations of three objects from a group of seven should be 210. Yay. We found 7PR by doing 7 times 6 times 5. Can you find NPR in a similar way? Uh-huh. You got N objects. And you are creating an ordering of R of them. Imagine, without drawing it, imagine with me R slots. 
I've got n objects I could put in the first slot. Once that object's there, I've got n minus one that I can put in the second slot. Once those first two objects are in those first two slots, I've got n minus two that I can put in the third slot, etc. Where do I stop? I'm ordering our objects. After I've ordered the third object, I have an n minus two. So I guess after the earth object is ordered, the last one, it would be n minus r minus one in parentheses. And yes, that can be rewritten by the distributive property as n minus r plus one, because I'm distributing that minus sign through the parentheses right there. So the minus one becomes a plus one. In our example, again, n is seven, r is three. There's n, there's n minus one, there's n minus two. Seven minus three plus one. Seven minus three is four plus one is five. That's what the permutation idea is and the number of permutations. And we're using still again, this multiplication principle. There's another way to write this that you read about involving the thing I was looking ahead on, factorials. Yes, NPR is N times N minus one times N minus two times dot, dot, dot through N minus R plus one. <clears throat> that is the same as this. What in the world am I doing? I'm doing this. I'm doing exactly what you see here. <clears throat> what did I do? I I multiplied this, this expression by a disguised form of one. The disguised form of one is the ratio of this part. That's a disguised form of one. For what purpose? To use factorial notation. The top is n factorial and the bottom is n minus r factorial. Where what is factorial? You learned about this in discrete math. Maybe you learned about it in high school, maybe even middle school. Well, for example, five factorial or five is five times four times three times two times one. 120. Four factorial is four times three times two times one, 24. Three factorial is three times two times one is six. Two factorial is two times one is two. One factorial is one. Six factorial is six times five times four times three times two times one is a 720. Seven factorial, I believe off the top of my head is 5,040. Eight factorial is 40,000 something. 10 factorial, by the way, is over a million, I think. You can do factorials in math mode too. Here be, there's, there's our exclamation, exclamation point. 10 factorial, yes, is over a million, 3,628,800. The same as 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times, oh, for good measure, let's go ahead and do times one. Same answer. Factorials grow very big, very rapidly. 30 factorial is, our, I'm sure you'd see it in scientific notation here. That 
50 factorial is already getting close to, well, okay, let's do 60 factorial. I'm trying to make a fun point here. That's already in the ballpark of the number of atoms in the observable universe, and I'm not lying. 60 factorial, 10 to the 81st power. At least according to things I've read, the number of atoms in the observable universe, universe is somewhere 10 to the 80th something. 10 to the 80th, 10 to the 81st, 10 to the 82nd. You might wonder, how can that possibly be when the number of atoms in a mole, which can fit in like, what, a cubic meter of air is like 10 to the 23rd. How can there be just 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire universe? Well, 10 to the 80 is much, 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 much bigger than you could possibly imagine. We're on scales that are beyond ordinary human imagination, but we can still work with them mathematically. What's zero factorial? One, not zero. Ah, one. I need to rewrite that. Zero factorial is one. What? How does that make any sense? Well, for example, um, this is probably better thought about in terms of a combination problem. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Well, you, okay, no, maybe we can think of it with the permutation problem. Pretend you've got N objects and you're going to take N of them, in other words, all of them, and put them in an order. How many ways there would there be to do that if you take all of them? Like you got seven people, you got seven different, or okay, you got, you got a baseball team, you got nine people, and you want to put them in different, nine different positions. All nine positions. You don't have 10 people. N is 9, R is 9. The answer is still got to be 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. In other words, 9 factorial. This formula is still got to be valid when R is, when N is 9 and R is 9, meaning I get a 0 factorial on the bottom. 9 minus 9 is 0. It's, the answer has got to be still 9 factorial. In order for that to happen, that's got to be 1 when you get a zero factorial on the bottom. You don't want to divide by zero and it makes sense for it to be one. This is a definition that makes things work out nicely, makes formulas work nice. It makes sense because of examples like that. Also happens to make, um, help make sense in other situations in math like the Taylor series. It's good to remind you of this. Like, e to the x. We will actually use this in this class. You remember this from Calc 2? If you don't, well, here's your reminder. e to the x equals all that, an infinite series. And, well, yes, it does start 1 plus x, but you could also think of those first couple terms as x to the zero over zero factorial plus x to the first over one factorial. At least in the case where x is non-zero, because zero to the zero power is un really undefined, but uh, that's sort of a technicality we don't worry about. And it makes the pattern fit if zero factorial is one. We will use this in probability. When? Uh, I think chapter three, actually, pretty soon. We'll use this series. Turns out to be a useful thing. Anyway, that's a, another formula for NPR. The next topic related to this is combinations. Let's motivate it by looking at another example. A club of seven people must select three people to go to a conference. And how many ways can this be done? 
looks like those two problems are very similar to each other. Seven people, you're selecting three. And the first one to be president, secretary, and treasurer, and the second one to go to a conference. Question is, is this a permutation problem or not? We're just selecting three people to go, go to a conference. It doesn't matter what order you pick them in for the second question. It does for the first. You're picking somebody first for president, then secretary, then treasurer. The order matters. Permutations, order matters. Here, the order doesn't matter. Going back to our example with four people, A, B, C, and D. If I pick A first, then B, then C, that's the same group of people as picking C first, then B, then A. Or B first, then A, then C. The order doesn't matter. So the number of ways this can be done is going to be smaller than 210. Let's go back to our simpler example with A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. These are four people whose first names begin with those. What is this? Example seven or example eight? No, example seven, I think. Now I'm pick out of these four pick people, I'm picking three of them to go to the conference. A, B, C, yes is the same as, C, B, A is the same as, B, A, C, et cetera. Take this equal sign with a grain of, grain of salt. It's only equality in the sense that those are the same group of people. Maybe it'd be better to write these as sets. When you do th write things as sets, it doesn't matter what the order is. I could also pick A, B, and D and write those that set of three people, <clears throat> excuse me, in different ways. I could also pick, how about A, C, and D? And if you think about it, there's only one more possibility, B, C, and D. There's only four ways of picking three people from a group of four. There's, there are four distinct groups four distinct groups that can be chosen. Not four times three times two, 24, like we got before. Is there a way we can reason this out that would apply to harder problems? Like, like the one where we have seven people and we're choosing three to go to a conference. The way you reason it out is to think about the permutation problem in two ways. So now I've got my seven people and I'm choosing three to go to a conference. Think about the permutation problem of picking president and secretary and then treasurer. We already know there's 7P3, which turns out to be 210 ways of doing that. But I could also do that process of picking a president, secretary, and treasurer in another way. I could first pick the three people that are ultimately gonna be president, secretary, and treasurer. And once I've got those three people, I can then decide who is president, who's secretary, and who's treasurer. That is really different, though equivalent to the other way. Initially, I was saying I got this pool of seven people. 
I first grab one person, say, hey, you are president. Grab a second person, say, you are secretary. Grab a third person, say, you are a treasurer. Seven times six times five, 210 ways to do that. Instead of doing that, I could say, okay, I got the seven people. Let me grab three of you all at once. I grab your shirts somehow all at once. I've got three arms. You three people are, are going to be my president, secretary, and treasurer, but I haven't decided yet who is president, who's secretary, and who's treasurer. Okay, now I'm going to decide. You are president, you are secretary, you are treasurer. That's a two-step process. By the multiplication rule, if I figure out the number of ways of picking three people from a group of seven, which is a which is the problem that I'm doing right now, and then multiply, if I've got three people, how many ways can I put them in an order? I'll be done. The way of choosing three people from a group of seven, the number of ways of doing that is called the combination. Seven C three. Number of combinations of three objects from a group of seven. That is the quantity in symbolic form that is going to be the answer to this question of picking three people from a group of seven to go to the conference. I don't know what it is yet. But I do know if I multiply it by the number of ways of taking three people and saying you are president, you are secretary, and you are treasurer, that it's got to be 7P3 because it was the alternative way of get, getting a president, secretary, and treasurer. How many ways of doing that are there? Well, you could call it 3P3 if you like, but 3P3 is more simply three factorial because it's three factorial divided by three minus three factorial, three factorial over zero factorial, which is three factorial over one is three factorial. It's simply just to write three factorial down from the beginning. And I could have realized that was the case by thinking about the multiplication principle and not bothering with that. There's three choices for the president, three, two choices for the secretary, one choice for the treasurer if I've got three people. I'm ignoring those other people that I didn't choose. And this means 7C3 is 7P3 divided by 3 factorial. 210 divided by 6, which is what, uh, 35? 35? With the simpler problem, uh, 4C3 is 4P3 divided by 3 factorial. 24 divided by 6 is 4, just like we listed out in the previous piece of paper. In general, The number of combinations of R objects from a group of N objects, NCR is NPR, the number of permutations of R objects from a group of N objects, divided by R factorial. We already know NPR is N factorial divided by N minus R factorial. This can then be simplified to n factorial divided by the product of r factorial and n minus r factorial. And it gives us yet an alternative way of figuring out, for example, 7c3. 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 4 factorial. which you can do with your calculator if you like, figure out, and you get 5,040 divided by the product of six and 24. 
and it's ultimately got to equal 35. You also can figure it out. You can actually figure that out without your calculator because what you can do is you can write it as seven times six times five times four times three times two times one divided by three times two times one divide, and also four times three times two times one. And you can cancel all those and you can do partial cancellation here and there and also here and there. And you're left with seven times five is 35. So you can actually do it in your head if you do that cancellation. And that applies even with bigger numbers. It's fortunate that both words, combination and choose, start with C. 7C or NCR. Again, is the number of combinations C of R objects taken from a group of N objects. We also, for short, instead of saying NCR, we'll often say N choose R. We've got N objects, we're choosing R of them. So it's fortunate that both words combinations and choose start with C. What a great coincidence. There are other similar such coincidences in this course. It's very fortunate that population and parameter both start with P and sample and statistic both start with S. More fortunate coincidences in this course with words. But for the moment, we're focused on combination and choose. I should also say there's an alternative notation for this. NCR is also written like this. And this is not a fraction. This is not N divided by R. When you see NR in kind of like a two-dimensional column vector like this, no horizontal line in there. In this context, it means N choose R. It means NCR. It means do this. You'll see this all used maybe more often in combinatorics and, and also in particular something you're familiar with called the binomial theorem. This notation is used more often in that context. There are actually a few other notations that we won't go into. Can I clarify anything here? How is this related to probability? Let's skip that exercise. In our last five minutes, oh, let's try number 20 here. Notice in part C, you're trying to answer a probability question. These counting problems can be pretty tricky. And to tell you the truth, I'm not a uh, combinatorist. It's not my specialty in math. It's Jed Yang's specialty, combinatorics. Before him, there we had a professor named Eric Gossett, who is Nathan Gossett's dad, worked here until just a, until COVID actually, through the 20, spring of 2020. He was into combinatorics as well. He wrote the discrete math book not my specialty. So I always, to tell you the truth, feel a little uncomfortable with these problems. Like it, I, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. But let's give this one a try. Can you read that in back? Okay. To get an opportunity to enter the McNeil River Brown Bear Sanctuary in Alaska, you've got to enter a lottery. For a given year, there are 2,000 individuals entered and a set of 120 names are randomly selected. Assume you and your friend enter the lottery. Part A, in how many ways can a set of 120 names be randomly selected from among 2,000 entered in the drawing? Here, with this lottery, people going into the sanctuary, evidently order doesn't matter. We're not picking a president, secretary, treasurer, blah, 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 blah.
You got 2,000 objects, the 2,000 individuals. You're choosing 120 of them to go into the sanctuary. The answer to A is 2,000 C, 120. 2,000 choose 120. The number of combinations of 120 objects from a group of 2,000. Should you simplify this? Uh, not completely. This is going to be a gigantic number. Can the calculator do it? Uh, no. Probably not. Okay. Error overflow. It's probably over a Google. Probably more than the number of atoms in the universe. A Google's 10 to the 100. Probably more than that. What you can do is you can write the symbol and say that's the answer. Another thing you can do is you could write this as 2,000 factorial divided by the product of 120 factorial and 1,880 factorial. And just leave it there. The number is too huge to write down. Maybe Mathematica could give you a scientific notation for this. I'm not going to bother. That's the answer for Ray. That's how you want to leave it. Does that mean we need to leave all of our answers in that kind of notation? I'm not sure yet. I think we probably can actually simplify C, but let's see. What about part B? In how many ways can the drawing be done in such a way that you and your friend are both selected? Okay, that feels a little tricky. In how many ways can the drawing be done so that you and your friend are both selected. Um, this is where I, I'm, I should have thought about this ahead of time because I always feel like scared I'm going to get this wrong here. This feels trickier. You got to make assumptions to help you do this. Assume, you get an A for today's class. Assume that you and your friend are both selected. So you're part of that set of, two, of 120 people. There's 118 more people that need to be selected out of 1,998. So the answer for B is 1,998 choose 118, which is still a humongous number, though not as humongous as the previous one. 1998 factorial divided by 118 factorial times um, 1998 minus 118 would be 1880. I'm using n factorial divided by the product of r factorial and n minus r. 1880 is 1998 minus 118. C says, what is the probability that you and your friend are both chosen? We are ultimately using, assuming each group of 120 people chosen is equally likely from this humongous sample space, how many of those are both you and your friend part of that group of 120? We're using the classical formula based on equally likely outcomes. It's going to be 1998 choose 118 divided by 2000 choose 120. The sample space has that many elements. The event where you and your friend are chosen has that many elements. This actually can be simplified. Sorry, we're a little over here. Hang with me. To what? Take this and divide by this, we're going to get some cancellation. The 1880s will cancel. We'll be left with 1998 factorial divided by 118 factorial. And also, ultimately, since division of a fraction is multiplication by its reciprocal, multiply by the fraction 120 factorial over 2000 factorial. And this can be done actually because of cancellation. This will completely cancel with this leaving over a 2000 times 1999. And this will completely cancel with this to leave over 120 times 119. So the answer is 120 times 119 divided by 2000 times 1999. And that can be done. Okay, we're out of time.
do it, you'll see it's a fairly small probability. 